Worship in Hinduism involves temples and households filled with sacred images. Elaborate ceremonies and practices form the centerpiece for many Hindus throughout the world. But these practices are often judged as overly ritualistic, something primitive and pagan. How can one possibly look at inanimate stones and metal carvings and treat them as God? In answering this, the first thing to realise is that symbols and images have a deep impact on us. We fill our houses with photos of deceased loved ones. We honour and cry over trophies. We wear wedding rings as a symbol of our relationship. Rationally, we know that they are just material objects, but nonetheless, they still ignite a response that we treasure. We even use rituals in daily life. When we shake someone's hand or wave goodbye, they are unnecessary gestures, but they provide a way of reaching out and connecting with the other. A world stripped of images, symbols and ritual is a world devoid of meaning and life. Religions such as Judaism, Christianity and Islam outright reject any form of image worship. The Old Testament and Quran explicitly condemn worshipping God with form. Yet the followers still cling to symbols to remind them of God. Symbols are the language of emotion and faith, not of reason and logic. In religion and spirituality, they are the way in which the transcendent reality is presented to our inner world. They bypass our superficial logic and tap into our deeper nature. We must remember Hinduism is ultimately not just philosophical, but experiential. Practices are geared towards achieving the direct perception of the divine. The key point to understand is that the goal of a Hindu is not to survive God by following commandments to attain heaven and avoid hell, it is to intimately know him. Cultures which maintain that the goal of life is only about salvation through a belief system will not place emphasis on rituals and images since doctrines are more important than experience. But those traditions which seek to know God firsthand are often flooded with imagery. They will venerate deities, saints, relics and even people. In Hinduism, anything which points to that transcendent divinity is used and cherished. The founding scriptures of Sanatana Dharma do not restrict the use of images, but in fact support and explain it. The Upanishads declare, Sarvam Kalavidam Brahma, all this creation is God himself. When Hindus declare that God is infinite, they literally mean it. He pervades the universe and is within everything living and non-living. The goal of life, as the masters have declared, is to perceive this truth firsthand. It is to transcend the mind and see the glory of the divine in absolutely everything, in ourselves and in all creation. This state is known as Samadharshina, or equal vision, where there is no distinction of people and things and only the pure perception of God himself. But so long as one has a mind conditioned by this material world, such a state is beyond our reach. So how can one access this elevated realm of seeing God everywhere? The masters have understood that before one can see God everywhere, we have to see God somewhere. This is the role of murti worship. The murti, or temple image, is the place where one can focus the mind and actually meet God, not just be reminded of him, but actually see him. Paintings, statues and ornaments can be useful decorative features which can prompt us to contemplate on the divine. But the murti is not just a statue that reminds us of God, it is God. A Hindu can make this statement not only because everything is divine, but also because of a ceremony called Prana Pratishta. Through a series of ritual steps, prayer and mantra, ancient rishis have laid down the process of how to invite the presence of divinity to reside in the image in a concentrated, focused way. As soon as this is done, the inanimate stone or metal statue is transformed into the deity itself. It is suffused with the energy and potency of divinity. Theologically, this ritual is explained again in the Upanishads where it is said, That is full. This is also full. From that fullness comes this fullness. After taking fullness from fullness, the fullness indeed remains. The verse explains a deeply mystical and profound truth, that the totality of divinity can manifest itself in fullness in an infinite number of ways without losing its nature. This is what provides the basis of Muruti worship. This is why stones, plants, rivers can all be seen as divine and worthy of worship. Hindus understand that through the science of ritual and faith, 
that unknowable unlimited God can be invited to rest and reside in the form of the Murti. The ceremony of Prana Pratishta is the process by which the all-pervasive, omnipresent God becomes available in a concentrated way even to the conditioned mind of a devotee. The question of whether this divine transformation of the Murti actually takes place or not can only be verified directly. Outwardly, no one can deny that the Murti remains as it did before. But even Western philosophers such as Aristotle drew a distinction between the accident, an object's outside features, and the substance, its essential nature. Once Prana Pratishta is performed, it is this essential nature which is transformed. The latent divinity becomes enlivened and awakened. God suddenly becomes fixed and localized for the devoted to honor and worship. For one to truly appreciate the effect of the ceremony, it has to be witnessed firsthand. The palpable energy shift and the benediction that emanates from what used to be an inert statue captures the mind and heart of the individual. But the science of worship doesn't end there. The Agama scriptures lay down everything from the various rituals performed to even the exact architecture of the temple. The Rishis have understood how the power of vibration can affect the individual and move them into a deeper state of consciousness. Rituals like the bathing ceremony where items such as milk are poured over the deity, the chanting of Sanskrit mantras, the bell that is rung, the conch that is blown, the materials used and even the hand gestures all have a vibrational effect, an effect that enlivens the temple arena and allows the congregation to participate and benefit from it. But at the heart of Murti worship is devotion. A devotee is one who is seeking to intimately know his chosen form of God. When he goes to the temple, he doesn't just want to be reminded of God, he wants to see him with his physical eyes. One has to understand that so long as we are convinced that the image in front of us is only a representation of the divine, then all we will be doing is worshipping a mental idea, a concept. We'll be stuck on a superficial mental narrative of what the image is or could be. A devotee is one who is willing to abandon the mind and its stunted logic and actually give themselves to the belief that this is actually God. And when that is done, the whole situation changes dramatically. It is the mind which digests the outside material world through the senses, and to the mind, the Murti will always be an inert statue. But by meditating on the Murti as God himself, the mind which clings to the outside physical reality becomes suspended. And instead, we start to look at the deity through a different lens, through the eyes of the heart. Depending on how willing we are to see the Murti as God, we will begin to perceive a deeper reality. A reality where one actually contacts divinity through the Murti. When the mind is transcended, the perception of the Murti as just a statue completely vanishes and only God himself remains. Hindus are comfortable accepting the paradox of God and a statue existing as one, in the same way that they are happy to accept that God and man exist as one, or that God and nature are one. Ultimately, if one is still stuck on the perception of the outside physical world, then one cannot fully see God. But when one has the darshan or vision of God, then one will no longer see the physical world. The whole point of temple and murti worship is that the constant engagement with an outside physical form of God naturally translates into an inner relationship with him. When the deity is honoured, praised and glorified, that very same presence becomes awakened and nurtured within. Devotees can live their whole life centred around their deity. The day begins with waking up the murti, dressing the deity, performing evening prayers and offering food. Finally the deity is put to sleep. To those who have not performed worship to a murti, it can seem too simple and childish. But as mentioned, if one gives oneself to the process and genuinely sees that they are serving God, everything that happens on the outside begins to happen on the inside. The glorification of the external deity glorifies that same divinity within. God no longer becomes a vague being in some distant heaven. He becomes the presence by which we do everything. He becomes life itself. The Murti is a portal, a doorway to the direct experience of God. The Rishis have understood that paradoxically, one can use the physical to go beyond the physical. One can use the limited to enter the unlimited. The full benefit of temple worship only comes to fruition when we abandon the judgmental dogma we carry and surrender ourselves to the process. To see and serve God who resides in everyone can be difficult. 
people are fallible and to perceive their eternal divine nature is challenging to the mind. By worshipping the Murti, slowly we realise what the presence of God actually is, and once we have recognised that, we become graced with the Drishti, the divine vision. As this grows in depth and intensity, that same Drishti allows us to see God in every living and non-living thing. But it would be a mistake to maintain that worship is simply a means to an end. The devotional masters who possessed the highest states of realisation never abandoned deity worship. They carried on performing rituals and saw to it that even more temples were established. They showed that worship was not only the way, but also the goal of life. They demonstrated and taught that so long as we have a form and a sense of individuality, then devotion and service to God never ends. It only grows in its beauty and enjoyment. There are many who propose that we don't need temples, that spirituality is about going within, not about external superstitious ceremonies. But this is a huge mistake. God is not just about quiet, introvert contemplation. He is about celebration and love for life. The temple is a forum for communities and like-minded individuals to gather together and centre their life on spirituality. Philosophy can feed the mind and give the illusion of spiritual progress, but a spiritual path devoid of grace is like a car without an engine. However great it looks, it cannot go anywhere. Murti worship plays a critical role in anchoring this grace. It is this grace that breaks down illusion and allows us to progress spiritually. It shifts the temporary physical world to the background and brings a transcendent God underpinning all creation towards us. The Murti is the place where one can serve God, where one can praise Him, where one can see Him, and above all, where one can be seen by Him. Many thanks for listening.